We believe in a doctrine called dispensationalism. In other words, we believe in rightly dividing verses to the right group of people in the right time period. Because if you don't do that, then you can combine all the verses together and then come up with major wrong doctrines. Now, what we're very careful as dispensationalists is that we're not hyper-dispensational. What's hyper-dispensational? Hyper-dispensational, what that is, is abusing, rightly dividing. So here's the thing. We believe in rightly dividing verses to the right group of people, right time period. But these guys overtly divide. And what they do is that they claim it's only Pauline epistle. So anything that is not Pauline epistle does not doctrinally apply to you. When you hear that, that is hyper-dispensationalism. That's a red flag. Now, we do believe Christian doctrine is founded at Pauline epistles. We believe that very strongly. And if there's any verse in the Old Testament or in the tribulation time period or millennium that conflicts with Pauline epistle, we believe that's for a different time period, different group of people. However, there is no denying to the fact that there are Old Testament verses, tribulation verses, millennial verses, that when they talk about these verses, they have some application to the Christian church as well. There are doctrinal applications to the Christian church. But because there are some verses in the Bible in the Old Testament that God commands you to do, some people assume I don't have to obey it because that's Old Testament. Don't think like that. When you think like that, then you're not going to do well. Because, I mean, come on, think about it. Then, like the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not commit adultery. Are you going to say that doesn't apply to you? Thou shalt not steal, that doesn't apply to you. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Well, that don't apply to me, so I can say God's name in vain as much as I want. So, you see that? This is something that you can't just uh, say, that none of these verses apply to you. Okay, so how you deal with this is you deal with 2 Timothy 3, verse 16 first. It says all, right? It says all scripture, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. But notice these other things as well, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Why? Verse 17, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto what? All good works. If you only take a partial amount of scripture, you got to realize this. According to verse 17, you cannot profit unto all good works. Is scripture only used for doctrine? No. You saw scripture is not only for doctrine, but for reproof, for correction, instruction in righteousness. That's why we retain and we will have Genesis in our Bible. We will have Revelation in our Bible because there's something that we can learn from it that we can follow good works. So we're going to cover some areas where there are hyper dispensationalists will say does not apply to us. The first one is Matthew 28. We're going to look at Matthew chapter 28. Water baptism. Hyper-dispensationalists do not believe in water baptism. We fully deny that. <clears throat> now, your hand should still be at Leviticus 19, because I'm going to show you something. But go, go to Matthew chapter 28, and we will read verse 19 through 20. Verses 19 through 20. The Bible says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. So notice right here that you're supposed to go throughout all nations and to baptize them. It said all nations. So thus, this is not only to Jews. You're going to see Gentiles included here. But hyper-dispensationalists, they will try to claim that this gospel is only to Jews. Jews only. This is not to all Gentiles. And actually, they're partially right. Because if you look at Mark 16, and then compare that with Matthew 4 and Matthew 28, we do know that the gospel, we do know that the gospel that they're giving is the gospel of the kingdom. So in the gospel of the kingdom, it started out with Jews, then it transitioned to Gentiles. And throughout all nations where the Jews are, it hits them toward the tribulation. So the hyper-dispensationalists are partially right on that. But I'm not going to expound on that one. What I'm going to expound is this part.
is that what we do know is that water baptism, is this applying to us? Hmm. Well, how we can do, how we can know for a fact is simply look what the church practiced. Look what the church did. When you know what the church practiced and what the church did, then you know that it is scriptural on what we do. Let's assume that this was only to Jews, water baptism. Then my question is this. Go to Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16. And we're going to read verse 31. And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved and thy house. And they spake unto him the word of the Lord and to all that were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes and was what? Baptized he and all his what? Straightway. So notice right here that they got baptized immediately. Here's another thing. Why is it that in the history of the church, read all throughout the book of Acts, why was there always water baptism? If baptism was not that important. If baptism was not that necessary. So how would we know that the command can apply to us? Because look how the church took it. See that? Look how the church practiced it. By looking at how the church practiced it, then you know that it's a, that it's the right thing to do. I mean, there are so many verses in the Old Testament that we don't, that we know that is doctrinally applied to Jews, but we know that the Christian church practiced it. Here's another one. Let's jump to Leviticus 19, huh? Leviticus 19. Look at verse 29. Leviticus 19, verse 29. So one, see how the church took it. The church didn't, didn't take it as, oh, it's, it's an option. I don't have to do it. No, they... Why would they baptize straightway? Why did the Ethiopian unit at Acts chapter 8 get baptized immediately? Why was Paul's converts, nearly all of them that he was witnessing to, why did he had them going through baptism? Here's another thing. We're going to look at Leviticus chapter 19. Now look at verse 29. Do not prostitute thy daughter to cause her to be a whore, lest the land fall to whoredom and the land become full of wickedness. Now, this verse says, don't prostitute your daughter. <laughs> now, here's the thing. Look at the Pauline epistles. There is no verse in the Pauline epistles that says, don't prostitute your daughter. So are you going to say that, oh, I can prostitute my daughter? Well, Leviticus 19.29 says not to do it. Well, you know, that's for Old Testament Jews. That don't apply to me. No, that is utterly ridiculous. You do know, come on. Do you know for a fact, don't you think for a fact that God hates it when you prostitute your daughter? Yes. Why? Because you see in Leviticus 19.29, he really hated it. What do you think he's going to do? Oh, well, that was the Old Testament. I throw it out. Forget it. So you see right here, here's another thing. You got to realize this. Paul doesn't write all the commandments of the Bible. If he did, his books would be a lot thicker. So Paul, he doesn't write all the commandments. Why? Because it's not necessary. Why would he then, why would Paul himself say all scripture is given by inspiration? Huh? Why would he say that then? As instruction for righteousness. So it's true that not every single verse doctrinally applies to us, but all scripture is not just doctrine, it includes doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness. That's a problem. That the man may be furnished unto all good works. So Paul doesn't write all the commandments. By the way, think about this. If you honestly believe there is no verse in the Old Testament that can apply to Christians, why did Paul quote Old Testament verses to preach to Christians? That's very telling. So you got to realize this. Another thing is that Paul used the Old Testament, showing that he doesn't think that it's invalidated. So you got to understand this. Then how do I know when the verses here, the verses here, the verses here do not apply to me? How would I know that, preacher? It's very simple. 
if it conflicts this. But if there's something in here that doesn't conflict, don't you think that the Lord would want you to use those verses? But if they conflict it, don't you think that the Lord, he's going to say, don't follow it? It's like, for example, who's the author of this book? It's God Almighty, yes? He's the author? Okay. Now, when he told you, don't prostitute your daughter and to keep the Sabbath, he said that at the beginning, right? You take that as the commandment. Okay, I'm not going to prostitute the daughter. I'm not going to, uh, uh, and I am going to keep the Sabbath. But then later on, God told you, don't, you don't have to keep the Sabbath. What does that mean then? That means that, well, I don't have to keep the Sabbath then, but I, don't, I must not prostitute my daughter. So he, you're not going, if someone gives you an instruction in your workplace, okay, and he gives you 20 different rules, but then maybe three days later or three weeks later, he amends one of the rules, are you going to automatically assume that because one of the rules amended, that all 19 other ones were amended and you're going to do that? No. Common sense. See, common sense is when a person gives you a command, you will follow it unless the person changes the command. That's common sense. The laws of our government work the same way too. You know that the laws of the government, even if it's 100 years ago, they still stand. Unless one of them's amended, then you know one of them changed. But that doesn't uh, invalidate all the other 99 or God knows how many hundreds to thousands of rules there are in the law. If that's common sense with man's laws, why can't you think that has common sense with God's laws? Now, here's the thing right here. If Jesus Christ himself, God Almighty, before he went to heaven, told you to get baptized, and God Almighty at the Old Testament told you, don't prostitute your daughter, and God Almighty told you all these other things in the Bible, what to do? what to do. Is that going to invalidate all his commandments when you reach Paul's era? No. Unless God told you and notified you there's a change. So this is common sense. So another thing is this. The final thing is common sense. Common sense is when someone gives you a rule it's not changed. Rule unchanged unless rule unchanged unless you are notified that it's changed. Did God ever notify you the change with water baptism? Absolutely not. Did God ever notify you the change with not prostituting, uh, not having your daughter becoming a prostitute? No way. See. So you got to abide by these other commands. By the way, look at this one. Look at verse 28. Don't make any cuttings in your flesh for the dead, nor print any marks upon you. I am the Lord. So we don't believe in uh, putting incisions on our body or putting markings in our flesh. Does that invalidate that one? No. We know obviously that's not the case. But do you know how many people are saying that's Old Testament, that doesn't apply to me? So they make incisions in the flesh and they put tattoos all over them? See, sometimes you got to understand this. When people, saying, when people say this is not a commandment, sometimes you have to look at their heart. Their heart's the issue. Why don't you want to follow that command? Is it because you have a fleshy reason to do so? That's mostly the reason why you're going to understand. 